in order to absolutely demolish 700 rated players, you have to do only one thing. Just think backwards. Really, the biggest issue in most of your games is that you're not letting your opponents go wrong. You're just trying to actively take the initiative all the time. If you compare this to table tennis, it's very much the same thing as uh, getting the ball over the net. And okay, you don't need like a great shot. Just get the ball over the net. And a lot of the times your opponent will just mess things up. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you how to apply this strategy with the Karokan defense. But really, what you're about to learn works out with any opening that you play. Alright everybody, getting another black game, facing a 600 rated opponent and we're gonna be playing the Karo Khan and the way we're gonna do this I'm just gonna be getting developed and then we're gonna be waiting for mistakes, okay? Basically, literally staying, uh, you know, hiding in the bushes like a sniper waiting for mistake. We see Hillbilly, we play d5, okay, fine, just d5, he's gonna take, we take back and bishop to b3, simple development, knights on the natural squares, bishop out, play e6, bishop e7 get castled, take it from there. Let's see if we can do this. Queen f3, weird move, we don't really care. We continue with uh, our own stuff, get a bishop out, targeting the queen. Queen to g3, play e6, idea to do bishop e7. Okay, he plays h3, very important, you want to watch out for his moves. Don't autopilot like bishop e7, lose your bishop. That's the biggest problem that a lot of low-rated players have. It's, you know, like you're driving a car, but you're not paying attention to the road. So when you're a beginner, okay, you're like more focused on the steering wheel, maybe at like finding the pedals or whatever. But you like really need to see what's in front of you, dude. Uh, so, okay, he plays h3 targeting my bishop, fine. We're gonna slide it back as a roll of thumb. Boom, bishop back. Next up, we want to do bishop to e7. Okay, bishop g5. Why we play bishop e7 always as a beginner? Because they hit you with the annoying pin. So we do bishop e7, we're always safe. Next move, nothing crazy happens. We castle. If he takes, take back with a bishop. Don't get double pawned uh, for no reason. And when this happens, we also get to attack the pawn on b2, which, what a surprise, opponent genuinely ignored. So once again, typical mistake, castling. Thinking, oh, I need to castle and then I see what to do. Yes, that's like what you need to have in the back of your mind. But you're actively looking for ways to punish the moves if there are any. So simple move, bishop b2. Yeah, you see, just play Karo Khan, play simple developing stuff. Completely winning position. Let's see, cd5 now. I think on CD5 we have a pretty instructive move because a lot of people would just go ahead, oh, I take free rook. You can do that, you're still gonna be better. But is the rook like running anywhere? No, it's not. It's it's the rook is so trapped, it's like genuinely the girl told you she is into you. Now what are you like? Oh yes, I was like having a crush on you for like seven years and I'm totally obsessed. No, you're not gonna tell her the truth. You're just gonna be like, oh. Nice, I mean, maybe we're gonna do something, I don't know. You just play it cool, all right? That's how you do it. So he takes on d5, you take back with a pawn. The rook is still trapped, it's still yours. You don't wanna allow any counterplay, like, uh, takes, you take rook, he takes this. Now queen takes on g7, this is like absolute madness. It's like, brrr, what is this? <laughs> Free queen, I just told you, you just develop and opponents are, Genuinely gonna give you pieces like it was a lottery. Okay, it's the rook is still there, dude. <laughs> it's like the girl has a sister and she looks even better. What is this? You take both the queen and the rook with the same thing. This is true. This is true, Madland here. Just right, I mean. I guess you don't really need a Europe video to win this position, but uh, we're gonna go ahead anyways. I'm gonna get my queen out and man, this is absolutely unreal that within the first 15 moves, you can trap literally three heavy pieces. Like this is absolutely sickening. I feel so dirty for doing this, but uh, I hope you guys find it at least somewhat instructive. Okay, gonna pick up the rook. Gonna pick up the knight. 
And then, okay, we're gonna try to trade all the pieces. Starting with a check, knight to d4 next on king e2, king d1 pick up three knight. Yeah, give this check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If king e3, this is free piece. Then can take bishop too. Maybe even start with that. And man, it's like move 20. Poor man. He's only left with pawns. <laughs> what is this? I guess this is just the power of the Kyle Khan. I mean, someone had to say it. You just say it here. And I swear, this guy is like not a paid actor. You think I'm like so rich to pay people to lose like this against me? I mean, think twice. <laughs> just gonna pick up this, take the knight, and yeah. Rest requires no comments. I'm just gonna bring my uh, heavy pieces. Now just gotta be careful not to stalemate, okay? <laughs> I guess this is something challenging on its own, like not stalemating. Gonna get mated, not stalemated. It's a difference between the two. And we get bishop checkmate, okay? Even nicer. So, yeah, uh, this was definitely a true masterpiece that I'm sure you have learned a lot from. So, with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting another black game. Put in place e4. Just gonna be sticking with uh, our simple Karo Khan. And okay. We get the advance. Guess the advance. Gonna be playing the Budvenic variation. I don't recommend you to play the main line because that is usually, uh, yeah, requires a lot of preparation against all kinds of uh, moves, aggressive pawn pushes, whatever. Really, you have no idea how many things I can play there. I recommend you do c5. The so called Bodvini cards variation. And the nice thing about it is that you're gonna be running into this structure a lot, okay? And you have to understand that we're pretty much just getting an improved version of the French defense. Because, okay, we developed the knight, and the difference is that in the French defense, you'd play e6. That's the French, okay? Just a transposition down a tempo. But, okay. You still have this, which is genuinely the wet dream of any French defense player. S someone had to say it. So we're gonna start by takes. This is even better, because he is forced to take with a pawn, okay? Beginners, watch out. Some of your opponents may take with a knight, leaving the pawn undefended. So you wanna punish. Now, you get the bishop out. Boom. And okay, then, you have a pretty simple plan. You have to understand that the main battlefield is around the d4 square. So, okay, knight to c3, not sure about this move. I feel like we have potentially even bishop f3 to begin with, but I'm gonna play it simple, have this defended first. And is he gonna do bishop g5? That's super instructive in case he plays. That's such a common blunder for this rating range. But no, he didn't. Then, okay, now that we're here, go ahead, pause the video, try to find the winning continuation for black in that position. Because a lot of people would be like, okay, just play bishop e7, develop, get the game, play the caro, have a simple life. But no, you have to do it. Bishop g5, you have bishop takes on f3, winning a piece. And that just works out well. I'm going to show it after the game. So bishop to e2, as I was saying, like main battlefield, d4. Knight doesn't have natural square because the pawn can take. And we're going to develop via e7. Then the knight is going to f5 from where it puts pressure on d4. So we do that first, don't play bishop e7 because then you have no square for the knight. So simple move, preparing to do this. In case of h3, we always take against the advanced variation, so you can uh, write down that rule. It's pretty simple and always works. And this is actually so nice that we get to face bishop to g5 because it is such a common thing for beginners, okay? And a lot of people have no idea how to deal with this like at all. Because, you know, we can no longer play knight f5 because the queen is hanging. And how do we continue? Now, second rule to remember, bishop g5 happens in this structure. And pin with queen v6. So, putting pressure on two very important squares while preparing to just play knight f5. And black is already close to winning. Right? I'm telling you. The advanced variation is just such a nice thing to play against. You're going to be genuinely getting this winning positions without really doing any effort. Okay, so he plays b3. How do we continue? 
Now, most people would uh, pre-move, knight f5, but also you gotta watch out for your, your chances, okay? Typical for beginners, they are just literally not paying attention to their chances. Okay, they think, okay, I play black, I need to develop. Yes, but you're playing the Alex Banza Karo Khan. The Karo Khan is literally going to be crushing your opponents. You got to be looking for those chances. So I think such chance is taking. Why? Because we eliminate the main defender of the D4 square. And okay. Question for you. Do you take uh, with a queen? Or perhaps with a knight? Because I know for a fact taking with a knight is what most of you guys are going to do. You bozos. And that is a mistake. That is a mistake. You can get pinned and lose your horsey. Don't want that to happen. You take with a queen. You even force an endgame where you're going to be having an extra pawn. How nice. How many things you're learning today. Such a, such a nice video. I bet you already liked, uh, liked it. I mean, you don't have to, but I guess that helps. But at least that's what they say. Just gonna take anyways. Gonna be getting an endgame. Had idea to fork and will always take uh, to damage the pawn structure. And okay. Now, you can play knight f5. There is no longer a need for knight f5 because there is no pawn on d4 to attack. So, I'm gonna switch to another target and uh, finish development. I mean, you already have a pawn. You know what to do next. You just trade all the pieces one by one. Go rook onto the open file. Um, and, uh, yeah, okay, watch, rook on the open file, what can you do? You can double up on the open file, but problem is, uh, he's gonna have, uh, rook c7, knight b5, so I'm gonna start by doing knight d4 first, okay, just preparing maybe rook c6, and then we double up, rook d1, targeting the knight, okay, now f5 is a pretty juicy square, um, uh, now that we stabilized, and next, Literally doing this, no matter what he does. I mean, on knight b5 we play a6, but other than that, uh, we just genuinely double up the rooks in the open file. Very important fundamental rules, okay? I cannot stress this enough. I may sound like a broken record, but you want to double up on the open file. You have no idea how many people still neglect such easy concepts. Okay, boom. Pressure on the knight. Rook d3 loses instantly. He has to play knight e2. Uh, and we trade rooks and then we win the endgame. Why is this losing? Pause the video. Try to find uh, how do we exploit uh, the pin knight. We basically PP on the PP. And not literally. Don't do that here, please. Just put pressure on the pin pieces. Right? The knight cannot move, or I mean, it can, but then it loses the rook. So I guess that's not, uh, not good news for my opponent either. And just by that, okay, like, what do you need to remember in order to win games like this? You need to know, okay, I get my bishop out to g4 after playing c5. <laughs> um, and I guess you need to know, okay, if bishop g5 happens, you play queen b6. And that's it. Easy, easy games. Just get to 700 by that. I could try to push my pawn like a moron, but... I'm just gonna start by taking his pawns and not allowing infiltration. Just gonna take these one by one. Not much he can do about it. This is coming. Yep. King is almost mated. Pretty funny. If he plays f3, then we have that. I'm gonna try to induce f3 with rook b2. Oh, he played it. This guy, you just helped mating. Wow. <laughs> wow. What a, what a genius. <laughs> F3. Sealing the coffin here in the mating net. King gets mated in the middle of the board. Pretty nice final picture. So, okay. Very simple rules to just take a winning edge against this uh, advanced variation. They play C3. So, start with take. Get the bishop out. Yeah, very simple. Even you can do this. I'm just kidding. I know you're doing great, Hurakara. Uh, and I appreciate that you're here. But, on bishop to e2. 97. Bishop g5. Sidestep. Okay, don't, don't play queen c7, okay? I saw people doing this. No, 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 no. no. You don't want to see this. <laughs> also, queen on the open file is pretty vulnerable. So, don't put the queen there. Queen to b6. Move. And remember this, take it with the queen. It's like, 
You have no idea what uh, big difference makes between taking uh, with a queen or the knight on d4. Taking with the queen always best. Do that. Win every single game. And uh, yeah. With that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. Right, everybody, getting another black game. Opponent goes e4. He's rated 700. So let's see what he has in mind against uh, our little strategy of uh, just getting a solid position and then pretty much just uh, waiting for a mistake to drop from the sky. Almost like a lightning. He's gonna play d5, all right? Let's see. He plays the move knight to c3, where the main thing to like really remember okay like a lot of people try to understand this variation in like greater depth before they even nail the first move it's important to go d okay as a rule always go d when you can in the caro because they just play knight f6 allowing e5 that is no good go d4 instead and then develop the knight okay he's gonna be generally taking i would assume that's why uh, i guess you develop the knight to c3 and here, I don't really like playing bishop to f5. That's doable, but kind of dry. Way more interesting. We play knight f6, all right? Heading for the so-called tarta cover variation. Inviting him to take. And all right, let's see what opponent uh, has in mind uh, against this. Like, mainly they take, but they could do anything. Like, really, knight g3, knight g5, knight c5, knight c3. Uh, even queen d3, like genuinely all these moves are covered in my uh, Karo Kanchisable course. On knight c3, however, there is a very simple idea that you want to remember and then you really don't need any fury. You can just develop, okay? So first, you don't want to play with bad bishop. You get bishop out, then you play e6, bishop e7, get cancelled, this knight goes to d7, and then we just wait for a mistake. Okay, I'm gonna do it uh, as I promised. And let's see, so e6, literally doing that, okay? And it's important while we do this, okay? You're also actively looking for whether you can punish a stupid move that your opponent just makes, okay? A lot of people make this mistake while playing the Karo Khan or just playing chess in general. They're like too focused on their own moves instead of focusing on what opponent just did first. Because, you know, it's like really... You're trying to drive a car without looking uh, at the road. It's like you're paying too much attention at the steering wheel or uh, maybe you just got a pretty attractive instructor. No, I'm just kidding. You got to look on the road, okay? You may be missing a lot of important details about the position. Like a lot of the times what opponent plays, it's pretty much just forcing an answer from us. Like you're thinking, oh, how can I come up with a plan in this position? Or how can I do this? Or... How do chess masters find a good move in a second? Well, a lot of your moves are forced based on what your opponent just plays. So here's your answer. Just gonna get castled and... Okay, what do we do next? We pretty much uh, need to uh, connect our rooks. So moving the queen for that reason would be kind of, uh, yeah, part of the plan. However, I don't really see such a nice square for the queen. So we'll start with knight b6. Why? We target the bishop and we prepare knight d5. Just trying to centralize the knight. Okay, boom. Centralizing the knight, we keep the knight on f6 because it's safely defending our king. Um, and we target his bishop. Okay. How do you think we should recapture? Because also got played and I think in this rating range there is a big ten tendency for people to exchange everything whenever they can. Which is something that you can really abuse, by the way. Because you can just give them opportunity to trade, but if you figure out it's favorable for you, you just have a life hack uh, for playing against 1,000 rated players or below that. So generally the rule goes, we should take towards the center. And we get this like really annoying block of pawns that's completely shutting down the bishop on a2. So pretty simple now, our next move is even easier. We get the rook onto the open file, you know that. Very simple fundamental rule. Just targeting the pawn on c2 immediately. And big chances he may not even see it. And we take it. In case he does not, we're just gonna try to improve our position. Okay, like there is simple move. Okay, as I said, he didn't notice. Besides that, because 
Square on C has just been weakened by his last move, so pay attention to his move B4. Like with a pawn on B2, the square is safe. With a pawn on B4, this square now just becomes a very nice little shelter for our pieces. So you could do that, but I mean, really, just take your free pawn, okay? Keep it simple. No need to like mess around. Take free pawn and then just try to double up on the open file or uh, exchange pieces, okay? Very important, once you just uh, capture the bounty on c2, we're gonna be coming back with a bishop, okay? It's like, uh, you know, the bishop went uh, out uh, hunting for food. Now it's returning back to his family. Okay, bishop is back. We're feeding the kids. And then we're ready to further activate and hope for trades. Or if not hope, then just force the trades. Here, it would be a bit of a mistake for him to take as the knight is his most active piece. And uh, yeah, he did not. Just play knight e4, targeting the queen and activating. Now, because you know his knight is the most active piece, how about we try to get rid of it? There is this move. Pretty simple way to eliminate a knight. But also remember, while you have your own ideas, you need to constantly check whether your opponent is making any dumb moves. So please feel free to go ahead and pause the video. Try to find the winning continuation for black, okay? There is something that just literally ends the game on the spot. Uh, because queen is lined up on the same uh, file with the bishop. And because of the last move before, this square is like really going to hunt him. So there is simple move rook c3, okay? No tactics, just you're realizing the outpost. Rook c3 winning the bishop, okay? Uh, all right. This position was like already winning. But the extra bishop, of course, will really heavily turn the balance into our favor. We take the bishop, we just need to make sure then uh, after the rook is uh, going to be able to come back into the game. I mean, it should be. Uh, otherwise, I guess this would not make it into the YouTube video. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, rook to c3. He just needs to move like queen backwards. Like these are the only two squares. Pick up the bish. And I don't think spending a lot of time will help. So he decides to finally sacrifice the queen. And oops, there is another fork. <laughs> Opponent just uh, like literally stepped into the trap. Finds the resign button and okay. How do we win this game? We're like genuinely getting developed. Fine, like this part, it's easy to do. I just set it on move three. Anybody can do it. And then, okay, we play, we look at our pieces, what can be improved? Yeah, like this bishop is fine, knight is fine. Bishop on e7, you don't have other squares. Knight on d7 is kind of the most passive piece that can be improved. So we go knight b6, knight d5, improving knight, and then he just makes a uh, big concession, taking on d5. We shut down the bishop before typical mistake for this rating range. Rook c8 and uh, you just have a really big target. Now if he defends, there is knight e4 coming to c3 already like black is clearly better. So yeah, remember this. Go uh, against classical variation. Take on e4 before you do knight f6. And uh, on knight c3, get the bishop out. Then play e6, get castled and wait for a mistake. So... With that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting another black game. Opponent goes e4. Going to be sticking with the, uh, well, not d6, but, of course, preparing the Karo Khan. So, yeah, playing c6, simply to take back with a pawn in the case that uh, he wants to trade. However, we get to face the advance. How nice. All right. Nice thing about uh, dealing with the advance is that at first it's going to be the most painful uh, variation for you. But once you get familiar with uh, my main recommendation, this will actually become uh, the top scoring line for you in the Karo. That's like normally how it happens. So, going to keep it very simple, playing the so-called but winning variation, c5 and... The main idea with this is black is trying to get an improved version of the French as 
most of your opponents are gonna do something like uh, c3 you get uh, the knight out and then you're able to develop the bishop before you get to play e6 uh, so putting goes dc5 which is actually the best move according to the theory i recommend the move knight c6 in this position okay this is my main recommendation this is what i give in my chessable course objectively best is to play e6 and just try to regain the pawn and play some kind of a french that's not the goal of our variation okay despite sometimes maybe uh playing down a pawn the goal is to get this uh, active bishop and okay precisely against uh, this variation uh, i think it makes sense to play e6 and just take us Bishop on f4 is uh, not like ideally placed, like it would be better for him to have options to push the pawn. And also queen a5 takes is generally not great, so yeah, don't overdo that. I know it's common for beginners. But I'm just gonna try to keep it simple, okay? I'm gonna try to keep my word and play with an active bishop. Okay, gonna do bishop f5 and then e6. Trying to regain the pawn, so if he wants to keep, he should play c3, which they almost never do idea being to prepare before he plays knight to c3 targeting the pawn what do we do we we'll simply defend e6 while threatening to win back the pawn on c5 so notice that in the first place we're sacrificing the pawn but white has to do some um, yeah additional effort to try and keep it most of the times i do expect you to regain the pawn uh, while playing in this uh, rating range and I'm expecting a move like bishop to d3 now, the way he's been playing so far. And you have, I think, a, a choice on bishop to d3. You can either do, I mean, knight to e7. You can trade on d3. The main thing that I'm uh, looking for and uh, what we're going to play is, uh, well, in this position precisely, I think black has... A very annoying move and it's pretty deadly sequence if you ask me so i think it's a good moment to go ahead and pause the video because i'll give you a hint these two points are pretty weak in white's camp and there is a way to actually target both and you do that with queen b6 okay, targeting f2 he tries to defend uh with the queen but then b2 is undefended we get to take that. But no bishop to b5, just taking free pawn. Checking. And very important rule. You take the free pawn, then you run. <laughs> Alright? You don't want to fuck around on f2 for too long. That's going to be getting you in trouble usually. Bishop back. He plays b4. Fine. Okay. Take the pawn, you go home. I don't care. Alright? Why f8? We don't want to go e7 because it would have been blockading the knight. And then the bishop could also like <laughs> maneuver like this. Because we have the extra pawn, you have four to do like a lot of things. This king is also misplaced. So then we can just stick with a uh, simple way to develop by applying the fee and kero. If you want to do it more ambitious, you could do h6 and then g5. I think that one uh, also works pretty well. I'm just going to do the simpler one, though. Um, the castle, then the rook goes into the open file, and then we challenge the bishop. Okay, notice that I could have attacked the bishop uh, way earlier, but usually when we play uh, this um, structure, priority is to get castled. Then... You attack the bishop. Okay, now I'm very happy to do all of these h6, g5 with tempo because the opponent is helping me to. I just get to attack his pieces in the process and he plays g4, targeting my bishop. I'm just gonna slide it back. Not interested to enter any weird complications. Mm, the plan remains very much the same. Ready to get castled and just look at his king. I think really king safety is uh, the biggest difference in this position. And also pawn structure, like the pawn on e5 is very weak. And what I want you to like really pay attention when you play the Karo Khan, we always have such a nice and compact pawn structure. Or at least if you do it properly, just have like two very healthy pawn islands while uh, 
Yeah, opponent's pawns are like really a mess. So, no, this move. Ready to castle, expecting something like maybe king g2, maybe knight f2. Okay, king g2 gets played. We castle immediately. Okay, maybe I have tactics like d4, winning faster. I don't care. I just want to get my king to safety. Okay, now I'm going to do d4. Eliminating the main defender of the bishop. Okay, that's pretty nice because when bishop takes on c6, the key little detail that uh, works out in our favor is that we have queen takes. So we take with a check and then we also get to pick up the free knight. So, yeah, nothing really all that special, just developing uh, our pieces. And we took advantage of that opportunity to play uh, queen to b6, double attack. And now we get to like really benefit from it because just look, bishop takes on e4, setting up uh, another nice little tactic with bishop coming to c2. Just gonna take, boom, targeting these two pieces. And pretty much collecting the rook uh, on the next move, no matter what he does. Like queen d4, perhaps he could bring the rook first. I'm just gonna take his rook. I'm just gonna keep it very simple, obviously. He can bring the rook, but I think maybe even more instructive for you guys is... Um... <laughs> Bro, what is he doing? Queen e4! Brrr. Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> Queen e4, just literally hanging there. No, he doesn't stop. <gasps> oh, what is this clown fiesta? Just taking everything. All right. I got to relax now a bit. Oof. That was a shock. <laughs> and then you guys are going to be in the comments like, oh, but they never blocked. Guess we the only give fanging pieces against you. I don't understand it. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, you're probably not looking in the right place. They give pieces like that all the time. <laughs> uh, now I'm just gonna bring uh, my rook and we get to claim the win. So, all right, guys. Now, very important detail that I wanted to highlight uh, during the game on queen b6. If he was playing queen d2. I think very clever, not taking on b2. I think that may get us in trouble with rook b1, rook b7. I mean, I don't know. It looks maybe risky. But I was thinking, actually, would it be bishop takes on f2? What do you mean it's a losing move? How is that a losing move? What am I missing? Poland has no way to defend against this, has he? There must be something that I'm missing. Oh, he has rook a2. Wow. Rook a2. So I cannot check anywhere. These squares are taken. And if I take, he wants bishop d2 and the queen is trapped. Wow. Okay, I didn't see this in advance. So apparently, uh, it would have been yeah best to just take. And black is indeed better in this position. Like rook b7, knight e7. White gets like a little bit of activity, but it doesn't really matter because you're in time with castle and you keep the extra pawn. And no need to be afraid of like, let's say stuff like rook c7 targeting these pieces because you have simple move just dealing with the rook. So keep the extra pawn and uh, yeah, black is much better. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, just for uh, those of you that are like interested in what is the best, I think e6 is objectively best and that's what I recommend in my course. But, okay, against these sidelines, you can pretty much do whatever, okay? I knew playing bishop f5 is a tiny bit worse, but not a disaster. So, uh, at the end of the day, you can do what fits your style better. And uh, that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting a black game. Opponent goes uh, e4, rated 500. We're going to be sticking with a Karo Khan, okay? I'm curious to see what the... 500 rated opponents are gonna be playing against our beloved opening and he plays knight c3 we're gonna step in the center are we gonna see d5 okay no we see d4 i was uh, like really expecting him to go for exchange within this move order but he plays d4 meaning that we just transpose into the classical variation where it is very important that uh, you stay away from a very common beginner mistake which is just knight f6 okay why is knight f6 no good well there is e5 and then there, there is like no good square for the knight 
So very important, okay, before you do that, you want to trade, okay? Always go DE4 in the car, okay? As a rule, when you are just getting started, it's easy to remember, just always take that pawn on E4. It's generally good. He takes with the knight, all right. And here you pretty much have uh, a choice, but there's like a number of variations. Like bishop f5 used to be the main line for a while, uh, which is definitely playable and something that you can do. But from my experience, that really uh, makes a lot of players quit the Karakan because it's simply not a very fun variation. Sure, it's like good objectively, but generally you're just really hoping to make a draw. So what are we supposed to do instead? We play knight f6. What is the point with knight f6 besides uh, allowing, uh, let's say, double pawns and uh, self-destroying the pawn structure? Well, point is, first of all, we're going to castle short. And this uh, block of pawns uh, will make our king ultra safe. And second of all, uh, we're just going to be playing for checkmate. I'll show you how. First, super nice that we actually get to uh, deal with the check. I genuinely be believe that this is such a common uh, motive for the for the variation. And it's important because you have a choice between bishop e6, bishop e7, or queen e7. Which one do you think is best? Now, if you're thinking queen e7 is a good move, then uh, let me contradict you. Queen e7 is a terrible decision because... You trade queens, he's just going to be having these end games with 4 against 3, where it's pretty much uh, free lose as long as you keep trading pieces. So generally, as a rule of thumb, you want to keep pieces in this structure on the board. And we're going to block with a bishop on e6 just because this guy belongs to d6. All right? You remember that. This is the most efficient way to block the check if you can. Bishop to f4. Now, I could go ahead and uh, grab the free pawn. I don't think he like really has any compensation for that, but that's not really the goal for this. And I think it's more instructive that we play bishop d6, okay? I know I just said we're not supposed to trade pieces, but when they play bishop f4, it's like much better to trade other than playing a passive bishop e7 move. I'm gonna do this, all right? Chances are he's gonna trade in long castle. Let's see, he may play knight f3. Point is, queen e2 is a bad move in this structure because notice how the queen is like really restricting the bishop. The bishop cannot move. So, for this reason, he plays queen e3, defending and opening up bishop's path. Reasonable move by my opponent. Uh, what do you think we're going to do here? Of course, we just get, get uh, castled as soon as we can. And next, we are ready to finish development. Okay, how do we finish development? How do we develop the knight? Do you think we play c5, knight c6? No, that's actually one of the most common beginner mistakes that I see all the time. Now, if you're playing the Karo Khan, you should kind of get used to the fact that sometimes when the pawn is on c6, we just cannot develop the knight onto his natural square. So, please get used to play a move like knight to d7. And, okay, we play knight d7 now, finishing development pretty much. Rooks are nicely defended and protecting each other. Very nice little fundamental uh, detail. And uh, what do you think we should be doing next? Of course, we get rooks onto the open files. Boom. First, rook on the open file. Why this one? Because the other one is coming to d8. So, very important. First, locate the open files. Then, uh, pretty much just uh, place your rooks there. I know I could have taken the pawn on a2 for a while. It's just that uh, I'm trying to kind of deviate from such trivial uh, free material grabs and just show you how to like get a playable position and then uh, utilize some instructive middle game plans. So rook to e8. Putting uh, rook under his queen is always very nice. He plays rook to e1. Now, you got to be careful because moving the bishop allows a uh, trade of queens for two rooks which is generally in the favor of my opponent. So we're not going to be doing that. I'm going to keep it very simple. Continue as I promised uh, with the rook to d8. And I'm going to show you a very simple maneuver. In this structure, always rook e8, knight f8 is very nice. Okay, preparing to take back on e6 with a knight. And notice that we have such a solid position. We have huge pressure on the d4 square that he's literally forced to play c3. 
which he did not. Did not play c3, what does this uh, mean? Now we just take. Okay, in case of c3, we had the choice between queen d5, or even pawn to c5 may have been interesting, just because we're very active. But on this, it's time to show you, okay, basically the school of Karo Khan. We were winning one pawn, and then we literally trade all the pieces. Take with the rook, hoping he takes so that we can improve the pawn structure. Now, I think, ideally, it would be best to take with a pawn just to repair the pawn structure. Like, taking with the rook is nice, hoping to get that. But in case he's not taking, we may not get the improved structure. So now we pretty much just have a clean extra pawn. I'm going to bring my king in the end game, defending this and perhaps preparing to push e5. Attacks the rook, just going to keep it as active as we can. And yeah, it was important in that position not to play hope chest. Yeah, taking with the rook, it's hope chest that uh, you get to undouble your pawns. No, you just get it as you can, you know, it's uh, it's there. Y you know, it happens for sure. Just going e5. And okay, if we could trade rooks, that is just making the situation uh, so much easier. But for now, we'll just try to grab space, expand, uh, push these pawns. Notice that my rook is nicely restricting his king and uh, on h4 just collect a free pawn. Very happy to grab another another pawn and um, yeah maybe play rook f4, attack this, make room for the passer. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna do rook d4 just for fun because we're keeping his king completely restricted and notice that my king and pawns are just gonna be genuinely unstoppable. So he plays rook d3 finally as a desperation sign, but uh, yeah, just uh, we can use this pawn as a deflection for his king pick up f3, and then uh, we can turn onto his other pawns, okay? I'm just gonna show you how this goes, and I'll also try to play it a bit faster. So normally you do something like this, and okay, I could literally just queen my pawns, but the trick is to try to use your king now that he's so far away, and you start uh, taking all of these pawns one by one. See, look how I'm doing it. You go, go ahead, grab these pawns, boom, and then you win. Okay, just uh, gonna use this. Get a queen. Can we show a mate somehow? Would be nice. Now, are we gonna stalemate this? Huh. I think I might have to cancel my pre moves because there is risk of stalemate. If he stays far away, it's easy. Yeah, he stays far away. There is no stalemate. Okay. So, yeah, generally, if you have time on the clock, I don't recommend you pre-move everything. Uh, imagine you could... Just imagining you could do, like, 15 pre-moves in a row. But, yeah. Play it slower, but I'm pretty sure you get how these end games are going. Okay, important there. Remember this idea. You have extra pawn. Give up this. And then you turn on all of these. These are like the real targets. The pawns highlighted with blue. You use this as a deflection. Okay. Uh, king has to go grab it. Otherwise you promote. And then you win uh, all of them. And then it's pretty much simple win. Okay. Now, obviously, because I have uh, two extra pawns, uh, this is not required. But when you have only one pawn, like imagine the pawn on e5 was not on the board. Say position is like this. This is the only way to win. So... Remember that idea, and yeah, on the opening uh, phase, remember to make this uh, typical mistake for lower players queen e2 check with bishop to e6. And then this guy goes to d6, you castle, knight e7, rook e8, knight f8, exactly like uh, we showed it. So with that being said, I think we can just move on to the following game.